Jar who's being uh, hosted by uh, Yorin. Yorin, you say a few words? Okay, so it's a pleasure to have uh, Saifan with us. Uh, Saifan is a PT, a Catherine PT, and then for a photo of Bella and Miguel. And actually, uh, he's been in France for a long time, where he's now at the USA. And uh, Satya uh, did a very good work to do this.
So the first attempt to model this goes back to 1961 by Murray Eden. And uh, so he was interested in, uh, you know, in, the, in the growth of uh, tumor. And he was just constructing the simplest possible you know, lattice model in two dimensions to, to study this growth of uh, tumors. And this model is very simple. So here is the model. So this is a lattice model. And imagine that in each cell, I mean, at each side of the lattice, you have, you know, you have a cell which can be infected or not infected. So in, initially, you start a seed size. So here is the origin of the lattice. And imagine that this, this cell here it, it has got infected. So the next time step, it can infect one of the neighboring cells at random. So it chooses one of the neighboring cells at random with probably one quarter, and it infects that. So for example, I mean, it can infect this guy here. So now you have two particles. You have a cluster. And once the site is infected, it remains infected for it okay, in the simple model. So you have these two. Now you have a cluster of site two. So now you have six neighbors. Okay. So the next step, this, uh, these guys, they are going to choose one of the neighbors at random, again with probability one sixth, and uh, infect that site. So for instance, it has infected this site. So now you have seven neighbors, and the process goes on like that. Okay. So what will the process look like after a long time if you do, if you just do the simulation? So what you will find is that after a very, very long uh, number of particles have been uh, deposited, what you find is that the cluster again grows in a circular fashion. But nevertheless, the same phenomenon, that the surface remains very rough. And it's this roughness that was, uh, you know, that excited a lot of people in the 60s, 70s, and 80s. Uh, so essentially, the average radius, which I call, you know, you take any angular direction and you look at the radius of the cluster, which I call H of E, sometimes it's called the height. So this height grows linearly with time, okay? But uh, when you look at the, the standard deviation of the height, that is the fluctuation, which measures the fluctuations of the surface uh, roughness. So these fluctuations also grows at any time as a power law with an exponent which is one third. Okay. So this was the numerical, you know, two, I mean, numerical findings in the 60s. And the, so the basic point is that the surface becomes rougher and rougher with time. Okay. And, uh, and the same phenomenon, this was the ideal model, but this is the same phenomenon again in this liquid crystal experiment. This is the experiment from Takeuchi's group in Takeuchi and the group of Sano in uh, Tokyo. And uh, so you see the same phenomenon. So you see this radial cluster growing. And, uh, and again, the height grows in any direction linearly at time t. But, uh, but if you look at the standard deviation of the height around the mean, mean height, it grows again as t to the one third. Yes. So this t to the one third growth law, this asymptotic growth law, seems to be universal. That is, you know, this is a very different sample, you know, liquid crystal uh, sample, whereas the yeah, previous one was a tumor growth model. And it turned out that this t to one third growth was uh, highly universal. So this is another experiment of paper burning. So you just take a piece of paper and uh, you know, like this, and you just you know, burn from the from bottom. So the flame front actually grows up like this. And if you look at the flame front, this is the time evolution of the flame front. So you see that it, again, you know, at a given point, uh, position x, if you look at the height, so the mean height is increasing in t, as linear in t, but the fluctuations around the mean height again grows like t to the one third. So this seems to be a very universal phenomenon, this t to the one third growth. And uh, so I talked about the Eden model. And there are many other models, I don't go into the details of all these models, that people started in the 80s, you know, ballistic deposition models, polynuclear growth model, directed polymer in random medium, asymmetric extrusion process, and many others. And all these models, they share in one plus one dimension, they share this you know, common phenomenon that the you know, standard deviation of the height is growing as t to the one third at late times t. So this is the universal t to the one third growth. Another way of, you know, if you want to be a mathematician, then you would say that the height at, at a given point you know, is, is just a random variable. And it has a deterministic part, which is the mean height, which is growing like vt. And then it has a fluctuating part. And the amplitude of the fluctuating part grows like t to the one third. Okay, so this was the observation in the, in the 80s. And uh, so, so you want to know, you know, you want to know something, you want to have some theory for this uh, to the one third growth. What's the simplest, uh, you know, you want to, you know, without going into the details of each of these models, you want to construct a coarse grain effective theory at late times that will explain this to the one third growth. And this is how this uh, famous paper of Gardner, Paris, Jacques came in 1986. And, uh, you know, this is, uh, since this paper was written, you know, this is one of the most cited papers in physical regulators, carrying more than 4,000 citations. 
And um, so they, what they need is to write down an effective stochastic equation you know, uh, growth uh, for this height model, and uh, which will explain this little one third growth. So more precisely, so here is the one again think of this geometry, and you have the h. So h is the stochastic field, height field. So it has two variables, I mean x, which is in transverse direction, if you like, space, and the time. So h is the field, which, which depends on the x and t. Okay. So and the evolution equation, for it's a noisy stochastic equation. So, so del is del t, so there is one term, which is a diffusion term. So this, this term is very easy to explain, because this is like, you know, if you pour a sand in a box, then the sand particles drop, and then they diffuse around. So wherever you have local minimum, the sand, sand particles tend to go there. So this term basically tries to smoothen the surface, okay, so this is a surface tension term. And then there's this term here, which is the noise term, which is just a random evaporation and deposition of the sand particles inside the box. And you can, for simplicity, you can take to the white noise here in space and time, uncorrelated. And this d is just a diffusion constant. So, so without this term here, so this equation, this is a linear equation, this is called the edwards wilkinsons equation, Sam Edwards in 1981. He wrote this equation with Wilkinson. And this one you can easily solve the linear equation without the nonlinear term. And you find that the, the standard equation of the height in this simple model will grow like t to the one quarter and not one third. So linear model is not going to solve it. So you need something else. And so what Gardner Price is actually is they argued, I'm not going to the details of the argument, but they argued you know, some kind of Landau expansion, if you like, and you keep the lowest order in nonlinear term that will give you a physics different from t to the one quarter. And uh, they found that the minimal term, relevant term, if you like, uh, is actually the grad h square uh, times some constant. Yeah. And so this is the famous KPZ nonlinear term. So what this nonlinear term does, first of all, is that if you did not have this nonlinear term, it's a linear equation. So this actually is an equilibrium problem because you know the, this term here you can write down as derivative of some energy, and so therefore it will go into the Gibbs Boltzmann state. But once you have this, then you can no longer write to the derivative, which means that this is a, this is a sort of non-equilibrium term. It's a driving term that drives the system out of equilibrium, and uh, and that's why you know it, it sort of. Uh, it's, more interesting in that sense. It's not deep in real physics, and it's one of the simplest, in, you know, driving model in non-equilibrium statistical physics. And uh, and in fact, moreover, they argue that you know, in this minimalistic term, when you have this term, you know, this explains the t to the one third growth growth uh, of uh, height uh, standard deviation. So so basically, you know, the uh, so there is a characteristic time so when time is below this t star. This t star depends on these parameters uh, new lambda or d. And when it's below that, it's essentially, you know, uh, more or less uh, this, uh, this uh, Edward Swinginson's T to the one fourth growth. And then, beyond this crossover time, it crosses over from T to the one fourth to T to the one third because the nonlinear term becomes dominant. So they argued that this width will go like T to the one third because of this nonlinear term. And this argument, okay, you can you know, argue in various different ways. One plus one dimension, there is an extra Ganglian shift, you know, the tilt symmetry. And also they are good by using uh, denomination group arguments, but let me not get into the details. But effectively, what was you know shown that essentially this, this model is able to explain this T to the one third growth at length time. So what is the driving? What is the driving? No, when you in the case of the liquid crystal or yes. So what is it? No, when you have when you have a you know when you have a surface, for example, you know, you think of simplest solid on solid models. I mean, you have some something which is coming in and something which is going out for it. You can drop some, some units of atoms on the surface, okay? So this drop, you know, this is random deposition evaporation, and the growth always occurs normal to the surface. And if you look at the, you know, the component normal to the surface, you know, so that, that gives rise to this nonlinear term. That is how they are. They are. So, okay, can you Yes. No, physically, it's, I mean, I mean, I'm saying that you're any growth models, okay? So you have this, you know, think of this, this kind of things, you know, you have the height models here, and you have, you know, some, you know, things are coming in and some things are going out, okay? So this is the random evaporation and deposition models. I want to write on an effective force current equation for the height field. But why is it non-equilibrium? It's like crystal force. No, no, it's an open system. It's an open system, right? It's not a close, you know, total height is not conserved here, for instance. Okay. It's an open system, right? It's a driven system, open system. You're driving, because what you're driving 
is that, if, for example, the, the evaporation rate, you know, the, for example, P here and the Q here, it's not P, P is not equal to Q, P is bigger than Q. So that's why you have a linear growth in the system. Right. So the average height is always growing. But, but crystal also grows. Yeah, so crystal also grows. So crystal Absolutely. also plays this equation? Yes, I mean, okay. not always, not every equation is described by Kepler. That's sort of one of the open questions. That what kind of, you know, what are the models which are well described by Kepler's equation? Okay. It's not that all, all models that you can think of in, in the two dimensions, they're all described by Kepler's equation. But there's a wide class of models which are well described by Kepler's equation. So that is my question. What what has this class prepared? Yeah, so that's that's an open question. That's you know, I mean this is you know this, this is you cannot if I give you a model whether it's described effectively by Kepler's equation, there is no uh, you know offhand way of determining it. You have to look at the exponents and you know determine whether it belongs to Kepler's class or not. Alright, so this is the sort of uh, so-called Kepler's university class, and you know this is the story of the uh, 80s to early 90s. And in fact, uh, the, this was, you know, this was a, again the RG argument and the symmetry argument. But the first uh, exact solution in a, in a specific model, uh, actually this was a solid on solid model, which was, uh, which was done by uh, uh, Deepak Third and uh, by using Bethlehem's techniques and he showed this if you want to exactly. exactly. So, to my knowledge, this was the first paper on the exact solution of this one third growth. And the funny thing about this paper is that this is the one paper, actually. You can see the references there. So it's like, a, like an abstract and look at it. So he, he never published the long paper. He was my PhD advisor. And I asked him several times that, you know, why didn't he publish this? Ah, he got interested in other things. So, <laughs> so anyway, so, so since then, you know, it has been you know, shown in many different. So just to cut the long story short, so essentially at the end of the 80s, so effectively by looking at this surface with standard deviation, that W goes like to one third. So this, in some sense, defined the KPZ university class. So all these different models, they all share the same to the one third growth, and uh, and they are you know efficiently well described by the stochastic KPZ equation. Okay, so that was the status at the end of the 80s. So now obviously a natural question arises that this does this university in these various growth models belonging to the KPZ class hold beyond the second moment? We saw this in the second moment. Okay? This is just the width of standard deviation. What about the higher moments? Are they also universal in all these discrete growth models? So the answer at that time was maybe. Nobody knew at that time. And there was some early numerical hint based on the universal, you know, amplitude universality of uh, for higher moments, but there was no clear answer. So, so this was I'm talking about 92. Now, so this is the sort of basic background of the KPC equation. So now I'll just you know, completely digress because there was a parallel development in a subject which is completely different around the same time, you know, in the early 90s. And uh, so I, I just digress, digress a little bit and tell you about a completely different subject. And then I'll come back to it. <coughs> so this is about random matrix theory. So many of you are familiar with it, but let me just, I'll just go through it very briefly. And uh, so what is random matrix theory? So, you know, random matrix theory was started by this gentleman called John Wisher. Uh, he was a statistician in Cambridge in 1928 in a paper called the journal Biometrica. And he was interested in the statistics of covariance matrices. But then in physics, I mean, uh, basically, you know, the random matrix was introduced by Wigner and then later, you know, by Dyson and many other people who work on it, mostly in nuclear physics. Uh, and, uh, the, those of you who are not familiar with it, I mean, I just, you know, just remind you what was, you know, the, what was random matrix theory doing in nuclear physics. So essentially, you know, if you look at the complex nuclei with lots of protons and neutrons, and uh, if you uh, look at the spectra of such a such a heavy uh, atoms, and you're in you're in the or thirty-two, you find the spectra. So the spectra are just the energy eigenvalues of solving the Schrodinger equation of this complicated many-body system. And you know, experimentalists can tell you the spectrum, they can give you the spectrum. And if you look at the spectrum, then of course the you know the, the detailed spectrum will differ from uranium to thorium. They are not the same, obviously. But you know, what what they notice is that you know there is some kind of self-similarity in the sense that, for example, if you look at the two the, the separation between two energy levels, and if you you know scale by the mean spacing, then the distribution of the gap between two energy levels essentially becomes universal, it's the same as in thorium as in, as in <coughs> thorium. 
So once you, you know, once you scale it by the mean distance. And uh, so then the question was, how do we actually calculate this universal, you know, gap distribution, this scaling function? And so what we told them is that, uh, well, I mean, if it is, you know, something universal, you can never hope to solve by, you know, by solving a complicated uh, many-body uh, problem. You don't even know the Hamilton here. So forget about solving the equation, solving this, uh, this, uh, this complicated problem. So what he suggested is very simple. He said, okay, I mean, look, I mean, this, this complex system is very complex. So maybe we can do the simplest approximation, namely that we look at the Hamiltonian in some basis, so it's a matrix. Okay. And he says, okay, when I don't know anything about the system, the first thing I'll try by, you know, by keeping the symmetry of the Hamiltonian, I'll just make it random. Okay. And let's see what it means. And uh, it turned out this was, you know, so that's why the random matrix theory came. So you just you know, think of the, the Hamiltonian in some basis as a random matrix with some with a given symmetry. And, uh, and you know, you, from that you calculate the gap distribution. And it turned out that this was, this approximate theory was extremely successful in nuclear physics. I mean, uh, and, uh, and that's basically gave birth to random matrix theory in physics. But this basic, you know, this basic dogma of Wigner, which was that you know, if you have a very complex system and if, if, it, if it has a matrix description, uh, for example, I mean, if you, if you pass electrons through a quantum dot, you know, you have a scattering of the waves and uh, you have a scattering matrix and you know, when you don't know anything about this uh, you know, mesoscopic system, uh, you know, first thing you can try is to replace the scattering matrix by a random neutral matrix. The scattering matrix has to be a neutral matrix. So, so and, you know, again, this was, you know, at least you know, in some regimes this was very successful. And so this, this basic dogma of replacing a complex system as a first approximation by a random matrix whenever there is a matrix description was very successful in you know, many different areas from physics, as I said, you know, nuclear physics, in quantum chaos, uh, QCD, uh, string theory, and, uh, and in mathematics, in zeta function, and, and many other things, you know, information theory, biology, and economics, finance, and so on. Okay. So this is the sort of excitement in dynamic theory. So just to get the ideas clear, so I'm talking about the n by n matrix, okay, with the random entries, and I want, I'm interested in you know, the matrices with real spectra. Now there are three classes of problems which can give rise to real spectrum. You can have a real symmetric matrix, which has real angles, or you can have a complex Hermitian matrix, which also has real angles. And then there's a third class, which is called the complex quaternion matrix. These are, you know, called the Dyson's, uh, you know, uh, three-way three uh, uh, manifolds of Dyson, basically. But let me not get into the details. So essentially, let's think of the simplest case, simplest ensemble of random matrix. So imagine that these entries of your matrix. And uh, they are just uh, independent Gaussian. Let's take a real symmetric matrix, for example. So you choose, okay, this is some constant of the variance. So it's just a product because they are independent Gaussian. So they are the joint distribution of all these entries, independent entries, is just a product of individual Gaussian. And you choose the variance such a way that you write down this as Gij mod squared, which you can write down as trace of J dagger G. Now, why do I do that? Because the reason is that once you have written it this way, you see that this is totally invariant under a rotation. So if I, if I have a real symmetric matrix and if I make an orthogonal rotation, okay, then this joint distribution of entries is completely independent. And uh, this is what we should expect because in you know, nuclear physics, if you are, if you are doing your uh, replacing your Hamiltonian by a random matrix, when you change the basis, the physics should not change. And so this is the sort of basic invariant ensemble, Gaussian invariant ensemble. And similarly, the complex Hermitian matrix is invariant under a Gaussian unitary ensemble. And this last one is the Gaussian symplectic ensemble. So these are the three Dyson threefold ways, and these are the you know three famous ensembles of Gaussian random matrices. So so this is the joint distribution of entries. Okay, so I give you this joint distribution of entries. You go and diagonalize this matrix. You get n j lagging and uh, and the name of the game in random matrix theory is to understand the statistics of the eigenvalues. Okay. So this is the sort of basic game in random matrix theory. So what do we know about the eigenvalues? So, so these are turned out to be strongly correlated in the following sense. So if I look at the joint distribution of eigenvalues, which was actually computed by Wigner himself and maybe other people before him. So this joint distribution has two parts. So there is a part which comes directly from the, uh, from the joint distribution of entries. Uh, because this is a non-trivial problem. You see that if I give you the distribution of the entries to calculate the joint distribution of eigenvalues from that, it's not a trivial problem. Okay? And, uh, but you can do that. And by making a change of variable. So you go from the entries to eigenvalues and eigenvector degrees of freedom. 
and then you integrate out the eigenvector degrees of freedom to get the marginal distribution of the eigenvalue degrees of freedom, joint distribution of eigenvalue. And when you make this change of variable, there is a Jacobian term which comes in and which is the extra piece. So if you did not have this piece here, you see the eigenvalues will be completely independent. The joint distribution will factorize. But because of this term here, and there is a you know, number beta here, which depends on the which ensemble you are talking about. Real symmetric matrix beta is 1. Complex symmetry matrix beta is 2. And Gaussian you know, uh, symmetric case is uh, 4. And uh, so essentially what this means is that the probability, it introduces a repulsion between the eigenvalues. So probability that two eigenvalues will be close to each other is going to 0 because beta is positive. So which means that this is, this is what is called the famous eigenvalue repulsion. When you talk about eigenvalue repulsion in nuclear physics, this is it. This is this term, essentially. So, so now once you have that, then you know, at this <coughs> point, the eigenvalue is strongly correlated, and that gives rise to new physics. And uh, so, there's a very nice way to interpret this uh, this uh, joint distribution. You can write, you know, just write the x to the power beta as x to the power beta log x. You can put everything inside the beta exponential beta, and write this as an energy of a gas of particles. So I can think of this lambda i's now as the positions of the charges on a line. Okay? And this is the energy, Boltzmann energy associated with this line. So forget about the matrix now. You just you know, think of a 1D statistical mechanics of the 1D gas of particles, where the lambda is the positions of the particles, and they are sitting in an external confining potential, which is parabolic, okay? which is trying to push all the charges towards the center. But each of the charges, they are pairwise, they are depending each other by this long-range log interaction. So this is a Coulomb repulsion in two dimensions. But of course, these, these charges are, you know, they are real numbers, so they are lying on a line. So it's not a Coulomb interaction in one day. But okay, it's a long-range uh, repulsion term. So this repulsion term is trying to push them apart. Okay? And this, this, uh, this uh, confining potential is trying to push them towards the origin. So as a result of the competition between these two terms, so what happens is that at length, for large n, uh, this system, if you look at the average density of particles, normalized to on, this is just a fraction of particles between lambda and lambda plus d lambda. So that converges the large n limit to the you know, famous Wigner semicircular form, which says that this density is just you know, over, uh, confined over a finite region of space from minus root 2 to plus root 2. And the density has this, so the higher density are near the origin, so this is near the bulk, and the density vanishes at the two edges. Uh, and, uh, and this is this uh, famous with the uh, semicircular law. And this is because, again, because of the competition the, between the harmonic potential and the mutual repulsion, which leads this, you know, drives the system to this, to this average density of states. <coughs> okay? So, we can do more. I mean, you know, just by looking at this, you know, if you take a typical snap, snapshot of the charges, so what you see is that this is the with the semicircular law. There are two essential length scales in the problem. What are the length scales? So the interparticle distance, if you are near the bulk, near the center of the trap, so the particles are very close to each other. And you can easily estimate what is the average interparticle distance. Okay? So you just integrate uh, the, uh, the density over a distance uh, L bulk and set it to be order 1 over N. Right? This is just a fraction of particles uh, between uh, 0 and L. And you know, if you just substitute this guy, it's the order 1, so you get you know, L bulk, which is the order 1 over N. Which is normal because you're putting N particles in a finite region packing them. So the typical distance between the particles in the bulk is about order 1 over n. However, when you look at the density at the edge, so here the number of particles are very small, so the distance between them they are sparser and sparser. So there is a you know the, the typical interparticle distance between the particles near the edge is much larger. And you can estimate again from the weakness semicircular law just by integrating from let's say root 2 minus L edge up to root 2 and setting it to the order 1 over n. And because this is vanishing like square root, then you get a, you get a 3 by 2, and you invert this, and you get n to the power minus 2 third. So n to the power minus 2 third, of course, is much bigger than n to the power minus 1 for large n, which means that the distance between the particles near the edge is much bigger than the distance between the particles in the bound. And uh, so what we learned from this simple exercise is that there is a length scale at the edge, which is of order n to the power minus 2 third. Just because of the you know, sparsity of the game. <coughs> so, the new excitement is in statistical physics and mathematics, if you like. Because you know, people have been in nuclear physics, they have been studying about these gaps in statistics between the eigenvalues. But now, you know, because there is a non trivial edge in this problem, 
So, so people have been, you know, studying the, what is the you know, age physics near the edge. And what you find, you know, the recent excitement was about the largest eigenvalue. So the, if I look at my sample, so there is the largest eigenvalue, top eigenvalue. So this largest eigenvalue, on an average, will be at root 2 here. Okay, because your density it, it just gets so cut off here. <coughs> so it will be root 2 on an average. But it will fluctuate from sample to sample. And we know the scale of fluctuations is n to the power minus 2, but we just estimated this. So, so you would expect that this guy to have a distribution uh, around its mean on a scale of n to the power minus 1 third. Okay, so this is this much is clear. And so what is this distribution? So this is what I have pictured here. So if I plot the PDF of the lambda max, then I know that on an average is 2, its mean is 2. And its typical fluctuations, the scale is n to the power minus 2 third. So you would expect there to be a scaling function of this distribution around this. And uh, what can we say about this, uh, this scaling function? So these two gentlemen, Tracy and Widow, they are two mathematicians from, uh, from uh, California. And uh, so what they, so what we would expect again, that lambda max and the lambda max, it should be root 2, that's the mean value, plus the fluctuation on a scale of n to the power minus 2 third times some random variable of order 1. And what they did for large n, and what they did is to, they were able to calculate the full distribution of this random variable. So they showed that it, you know, it, it satisfies some one way two differential equation. It's still, okay, it's a complicated thing. I'm not getting into the mathematics of this. But basically, they calculated this uh, distribution of this kind of beta. And it has this following picture. So this is the PDF of this, uh, this color of beta. And uh, random variable. <coughs> so you, first of all, it depends on beta. Beta equal to 1, 2, 4. And it looks Gaussian, but it's non-Gaussian. Okay. In fact, for the very large negative x, it builds like exponential minus mod x cubed, whereas for large positive x, it goes like x cubed. So this was in 1994. And you know, it created uh, some excitements in mathematics, and it's a beautiful mathematical theory. But you might ask, you know, so what? I mean, okay, I uh, calculate lambda max, but you know, at that time, there was uh, no application of this uh, tracing medium distribution, apart from the fact that it was a beautiful mathematical result. So now I've told you two different things. Okay, I told you about the KPZ growth, and I told you about the random matrix theory and tracing medium distribution. So what's the connection between the two? And this came over, I mean, after almost five years uh, after 1994. And this was in a sort of landmark paper <coughs> by by Dyke and Johnson. So these three gentlemen, so they are again mathematicians. Uh, so Johnson is in Sweden and uh, Basi Dyke in Princeton and uh, Jimbo by in Michigan. Now they didn't solve you know uh, you know the KBZ problem, but they solved another problem, which is called the Mulam project. And this was you know a beautiful problem which was open for a very long time. So let me tell you about that, it's very funny. So Stanislaw Udon, so he's a very famous physicist and mathematician, if you like. And he's known for many things, and not many people know about this. So for example, you know, Taylor was the Ulam design of hydrogen bombs. So when Taylor was working with the hydrogen bomb in, in, in Los Angeles, so his, his, you know, his formula, his design didn't work. Okay. So then Ulam actually found the mistake, and he actually you know, uh, found the correction. And since then, it's called the Taylor with the Ulam design of the hydrogen bombs. <coughs> then, you know, many of you know about Farby was the Ulam problem, which basically started out in nonlinear science. And then the other thing, which you know, you not many people know, which is that Metropolis algorithm, the Monte Carlo method that we all of us use every, in our everyday thing. So this was actually again uh, essentially Ulam's contribution. Ulam was actually his uncle was going to gamble in Monte Carlo. And you know that's how he got interested in this because he was trying to see how his uncle uses money. So he came up with you know, this Monte Carlo method, and with Metropolis they wrote the first paper on uh, Monte Carlo you know, method in 1954. And uh, so you know, he was an extremely talented uh, uh, guy. And in fact, I mean the, the instrument that uh, he is holding here, I don't know if you can guess, but this is something called uh, uh, Fermi actually. So essentially what happened is this, uh, you know, when Ulam came up with the Monte Carlo method, so uh, <coughs> Farby heard about this, and he actually designed a machine. This is the first computer, if you like. It's called Farby Act. Okay, so he would test the Monte Carlo uh, method, and uh, this was a standard of computer that Farby built. So anyway, so Ulam, in 1961, he was uh, teaching a class, and uh, he gave a problem in the exam. 
and uh, we give a problem. In fact, this problem is now called the longest increasing subsequence formula. Let's make it. We give this problem, but uh, none of the students could do this problem. And they could not try it himself. He also couldn't do it. <coughs> and it took 50 years to solve this problem. And this is the famous Ulam problem. So let me just tell you what the problem is. The problem is actually very simple. So you take a sequence, let's say 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 10. Okay? Just a sequence of integers. Okay? Now, there are n factorial, n big big number, so n factorial possible permutations. So for example, the typical permutation is 8, 2, 7, 1, 3, 4, 10, 6, 9, 5. So you take one such permutation, like this one, okay? and then from this permutation, you construct all possible increasing subsequences. What do I mean by that? Let's take an example. So I could take, for example, <coughs> 8 and 10, which is a subsequence. And the only restriction is that they don't have to be next to each other. Okay, 8 is there, 10 is there. But only concept, uh, the restriction is that it has to be increasing. So 8, 10 to be increasing. So this is an allowed subsequence. Then you can take 2, 3, 4, 10. Again, it's increasing. And this is the subsequence of this. 1, 3, 4, 10. 1, 3, 4, 6, 9. So you think of all possible in increasing subsequences <coughs> from this given permutation. Okay. And then, out of all possible subsequences, you find out the longest ones. So in this example, you can convince yourself that 1, 3, 4, 6, 9, and 2, 3, 4, 6, 9. So these are the two longest sequences. It can be degenerate. But what you are interested in is not in the number, but you are interested in the length of this uh, <coughs> longest increasing subsequence. So in this example, the L is 5. So this file, now if I, if I give you a different permutation of these numbers, again you play the same game, you will find a different value of n, right? So n will fluctuate from one permutation to another. That's clear. So now, imagine that all these permutations occur equal time. That means they occur only in one over n factor. Okay. So that means this induces a measure, that means n also fluctuates from sample to sample. So it has a n random variable now at ln. And you want to know what is the statistics of LN. For example, what's the mean value of LN given this uh, measure? What's the you know, standard deviation? What's the distribution of LN? So this is the Gulag problem. So what is the statistics of it? So no wonder the students failed in the exam. So, <laughs> so anyway, so, so as I said, it took 50 years to solve this problem. So first, average length of the longest increasing subsequence. It was shown by himself and many other people later on, uh, including Jacobs uh, and Andrews that it actually grows like, it of course increases with the uh, size of your sample. So this is, goes like square root of n. So the fact root is exactly 2. <coughs> then it took 20 more years to prove that the typical fluctuations, the standard deviation around this mean, goes like n equal 1 sixth. <coughs> so people knew at the end of, you know, I don't know, uh, uh, that essentially ln uh, as a random variable has a deterministic power which is 2 root n mean value plus a fluctuation, which is n to the power 1 sixth, times a random variable, by 2. But you know, people didn't know what this random, what's the distribution of this random variable is. And what White, Dyke, and Johnson did, after a real 2 d force calculation in this 120 page paper, what they proved is that the distribution of this random variable, that is, you know, you subtract of the mean and divide by width, this, of this Ulam problem, this is exactly the same as the tracing Williams distribution of the largest time value of a Gaussian unitary ensemble, that is theta equal to 2. It's 2 here, it is theta equal to 2. So this was the first application of the tracing Williams thing, that, you know, that it made a completely different problem, which is Ulam problem. And uh, so this work of by Jack Johnson, this is the, which initiated the KBZ story phase 2. And uh, I, I will not get into too much detail. But what happened subsequently is that what you could show is that several discrete growth models that I talked about in the beginning, like the statistic deposition model and directed polymer and so on. So all these problems, it could be mapped to the Ulam problem. So remember that the Ulam problem, the length of the longest increasing subsequence was going like 2 plus 8 plus 8 plus 1 6 times this pi 2, which is a tracing with a Gini variable. So what happened by this mapping, which I'm not showing you, that these crazy growth models in this, you know, this circular geometry, the height was going like vt. So this vt is the analog of this guy, and this t to the power one third 
is the analog of this guy here. And this I2 has the same pattern, which has the tracing gem distribution. So this mapping, so height of these KPZ discrete growth models maps onto the longest increasing subsequence problem in the long problem. And with this identification that n, the length of the sequence is like t squared time is the uh, I'm not again I'm not showing you the exact mapping, but this is how it uh, I don't have time for that, but this is how it, it, it happened and it was showing many, many different uh, problems. Okay. So for instance, I mean I mean I talked about the long problem, but then directed polymer in Dynamic medium from nuclear growth models. Well, it's again HIV. We showed that this is true for the ballistic deposition model. The sequence alignment problem in the national problem in biology and so on. So there are some issues. So basically, the upshot is that in all these problems, which are known to belong to the KGC university class, the height distribution of the height of once you center and scale, this is exactly the same as the tracing term distribution. So this is the big thing in uh, you know big uh, development in the early you know 2000. So to summarize, the, if you look at these all these discrete KPZ growth models, and if you look at the height distribution, I mean after we subtract of the mean, and then if you divide by this TPZ one third, this scaling function is totally universal. The C may be non-universal, this constant C here, but the scaling function f to x is totally universal. It's model independent, and it is given by the tracing minimum distribution. It was not obviously clear that why, what has this got to do with random matrix theory because this involved a series of mappings and so on and it's still not very clear that what, what is, what has this got to do. But this is the sort of, you know, development in the, in the early part of this, um, this century. And, uh, and then, so basically, so <coughs> you know, just from the chart, essentially, you know, all these discrete KPZ growth models, you could map to the Ulam problem, which subsequently can be mapped to random matrix theory using this connection by by time transfer. Okay, so this is how it developed. And uh, and there's another interesting thing which was noticed, that is if you look at the I talked about the circular geometry like in model and so on, but you could also construct this, this height model like in flat geometry again in going out your position position. So so here, so so what, what happens here, so it depends on the initial condition, if you start with the flat initial condition, and if you start with the droplet, so called droplet initial condition. So what happens is that if you look at this, uh, this uh, you know, when you subtract the height, you, uh, you know, just look at the fluctuating part of it, pi beta. So depending on the initial condition, if the flat geometry is given by the tracing medium Gaussian orthogonal ensemble, but if it is a circular geometry or droplet geometry, it is given by the tracing medium G. So the initial condition in this growth problem maps onto the symmetry classes of the random matrix theory. Why? Nobody knows. It's, it's, it's just a calculation, and you know, it's, it's, it's not. It's, it's, this is still an open problem to understand, to have intuitive understanding that why the initial condition translates into the symmetry classes. So, so since this work of you know by Dan Johnson, so tracing medium distribution, you know has now been found in so many different areas, even it has become totally ubiquitous. It's like the Gaussian distribution in the automatic in, 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 in uh, central limit theory. It has been found in many problems from gauge theory to, to directed polymer to sequence alignment, spin classes, and many other problems. And uh, it has been found in many experiments. I talked about the uh, liquid crystals. Then this was a fiber laser experiment in Weizmann. And this is another in, uh, in strongly disordered superconductors in the films, and so on. And uh, so this is, uh, there are many popular articles which have been written on this uh, ubiquity of tracing medium distribution. So one of the open questions is that why is this tracing medium distribution so ubiquitous? I mean, you don't see random matrix theory in some of the problems. You know, there is no apparent connection to random matrix theory. Yet, you know, it, it, it happens to be extremely universal. So this is the uh, thing. So now, last thing, which comes to the phase three. So, so, so far I talked about it all. Thanks to this long problem, uh, that you could solve that you know many of the discrete growth models which belong to the KPZ class, you could show that the highest distribution is in the tracing term distribution. So you can ask what about the continuum KPZ equation itself? So you would expect, of course, because you know this is sort of effectively describes the late time evolution of these discrete growth models, that the high distribution here also should be uh, should be tracing term. But to demonstrate that was not easy. And uh, because you know, and this is the sort of the main problem 
to demonstrate that mathematically it was very difficult because mathematical sense, you know, didn't, didn't like it in this equation, right? Because it has noise and it has very kinky surface. So what does it mean, granites and uh, granite square? So you know, so you need to understand KP's equation if you want to understand mathematically rigorously. You have to think of some regularization schemes. And what was not clear is that if you use different regularization schemes of the KPC problem, different way of discretizing this equation, it may lead to different physics. And so you know, it was not very clear what is the proper regularization scheme. And uh, and this is the sort of led to uh, Martin Hitler in Finland in 2014. Because what he showed is that no matter which different, you know, different types of regularization schemes, essentially, you know, gives rise to the same fixed point physics uh, described by the So there's a unique fixed point irrespective of different regularization schemes. And so this led to a lot of interest in mathematics community. And uh, okay, I'm not going into the details, but it sort of combined efforts of physicists and mathematicians over the last five years, essentially. Uh, would prove that even in this particular <coughs> stochastic equation, the height uh, again has the same physics, that is there's a deterministic part linear, there's a fluctuating part if you want to, and this distribution of this random variable is given by the tracing of the distribution, and uh, depending on the initial conditions, for flat geometry is tracing the GOE.